August 13, 2004. Anjana Bai Borgar joined 200 women to murder Aku Yadav, the serial rapist who killed her daughter. While she did get the vengeance she desperately craved, what happened to her next changed the course of her life forever. Here's some moms who took revenge for their kids' brutal murders. Barbara Graham 49-year-old Barbara Graham shot and killed the man who murdered her son just three days after the funeral. The only problem was she killed the wrong person. January 26th. 2000. 22 year old Kiko Smith was watching TV at his home when two friends called him to join him in a car outside. Barbara then confronted him as he stepped out of the house, asking him twice if his name was Kiko. When he nodded his head in confirmation, she reached inside her purse, pulled out a 45 caliber handgun, and had it point blank at Kiko. Terrified, Kiko would run for his life while Barbara and her accomplice, Mora, pursued him, firing bullets as he fled. Eventually, he was fatally shot in the parking lot on Elvins Road in Anacostia, Washington at the 2400 block. Now, Before this moment, Jermaine Drummond, the driver of their getaway car, instructed Walton Chester Lee Jr., Kiko's friend, who called him outside, to inform Barbara that Kiko wasn't the one who killed her son. Despite this, Barbara refused to believe it because her son, Le Pierre Clement, had mentioned having some kind of conflict with Kiko when he was alive. However, Kiko had a different account of the events. In 1996, Kiko did have strong beef with Clemens, but the following year, they became friends again. And according to his testimony, just two days before Clemens was killed, the two men smoked marijuana together in the car in which Clemens showed him his gun, the same gun that was used to shoot him down. To Kiko's luck, he survived, but sustained life-threatening injuries in the process. He was hit with three bullets with one lodged in his spine. Now he's paralyzed from the waist down and confined to a wheelchair. When rushed to the hospital, Kiko told cops that Barbara was responsible, and she was subsequently arrested, along with her daughter's boyfriend, Mora. Now During her trial, her attorney claimed that when she asked Kiko for his name, she assumed he said Tiako, the name of the other guy who was a major suspect in her son's death. And while the jury found this piece of information baseless, the trial drew a lot of attention, and I'll explain why in a moment. You see, in the US, few mothers have ever been accused of using a gun to find justice for a child slaying, with experts saying it's almost unheard of. Conversely, the killing of her son occurred in a city where many murders have gone unsolved, and where the consequences of this are not fully understood. For all the mothers who have lost their sons or daughters in this district, police and prosecutors couldn't remember a mother charged with picking up a gun and trying to avenge her child's death. So it is somewhat new to the court and they didn't know how to deal with it properly. Because as much as Barbara was in the wrong, her actions could be justified, given that the cops failed her, dragging the investigation about her son's death while also claiming he was a drug lord. So maybe frustration along with a perfect blend of anger just pushed Barbara to take the law into her own hands. On top of this though, she had tons of supporters. Throughout her trial, she was backed by top politicians and lawyers. However, none of that could stop the hands of justice that were about to descend upon her. January 2001, Barbara Graham, wearing a gold suit and a fancy scarf, was found guilty by a jury on nine separate counts related to the shooting of Kiko Smith. Graham's three other children looked as their mother was being sent away, to be locked up for 15 to life. On the other hand, her accomplice, Erskine Moore, was handed a similar sentence. And as for Kiko Smith, well, we don't think he'll ever be able to walk again. Anjana Bai Borkar June 8, 1999, Borkar's daughter, Asha Bagat, was raped, murdered, and mutilated at the hands of a Kasturba Nagar gangster, serial raped and murderer named Bharat Kalikaran Yadav, or Aku Yadav. For over a decade, the women of Kasturba Nagar endured suffering inflicted by this evil man. Men from the outside of town hesitated to propose marriage, fearing women might have been victims of Yadav's abuse, a fear justified by reality. Now, Yadav violently assaulted these women at will, subjecting daughters and even their mothers to with no one intervening. On random nights, he would barge into different homes, demanding money and forcefully taking women. And if anyone reported it to the police, they would either be laughed at or chased away from the station. And if that sounds crazy, well, it is. But there's a reason behind it. In India, admitting to being is considered taboo. 
But despite this, many of Yadav's victims bravely reported the crime. But for every time he was arrested, he was almost immediately granted bail. Then shockingly, the police would give him the details of whoever made the report against him for Yadav to retaliate. These corrupt officials accepted bribes from Yadav in exchange for protection. When one of his victims reported rape, the police accused her of having an affair with him and dismissed her complaint entirely. Several others were also sent away after being told, You're a loose woman. That's why he raped you. Out of all the women he would torture, there would be one he couldn't have. And that's Ana Jabai Borgar's daughter, Bagat. Now Bagat was a mother herself, working in a shelter for the poor and the disadvantaged. She stood up for anybody who had been tortured and beaten by this person, and was the only woman who could outrightly accuse him of his depraved acts. As such, he started seeing her as a thorn in his side that he needed to get rid of. On that fateful day, Yadav ambushed Bagat in her own home. He killed her and then instructed his men to mutilate her body. This horrific crime prompted her mother to report this incident to the police. Given the severity of the crime, Yadav was arrested. However, to the dismay of many, he was only sentenced to 16 months in prison before being released back onto the streets. Anger and frustration are the words that can't express the emotions Borkar felt knowing that the very man who killed her daughter was back on the streets doing the same thing to almost every other girl out there. Ana Jabai Borkar knew this man had to be stopped. She wanted, no, needed to end his days of terror. And it was at that moment when she resolved to seek justice for her daughter. In 2004, Yadav found his next victim, an educated lady named Usha Nadayani. Nadayani had helped a lady file a case against Yadav for molesting her. In turn, Yadav had a few of his men surround Nadayani's home post midnight and demand that she let him in. This woman refused and instead responded by dragging a cook and gas cylinder to the door, opening that valve and threatening to light a match to set herself and anyone else in close proximity on fire. Yadav and his gang retreated immediately. And Nadiani's action made it clear to the people of Kasturba Nagar that Yadav could indeed be stopped. Only if they fought back violently, Nadiani, Anajabai Borgar, and over 200 women came together to orchestrate Yadav's murder. Fear had vanished, replaced by frustration and determination. August 6, 2004, these women marched to Yadav's home, but by the time they arrived, Yadav had already been arrested or perhaps taken to safety by his police friends. The following day, though, he appeared before the Nagpur District Court, coming out of his cell to meet more than 500 residents of the town, comprising of men, women, and children who cheered in victory for his arrest. Yet Yadav swore that he would return to teach every woman in the slum a lesson. And he was on the verge of doing so, after the court agreed to grant him bail pending his trial date. Borgard and her compatriots stormed the court, but this time wielding vegetable knives and chili pepper. And when they saw him in courtroom number 7, they splashed him with the pepper, and then just slashed his body with knives from all different angles. Due to the number of women here, the officers guarding him ran away. Within 15 minutes, his lifeless body lay on the courtroom floor, a scene dripping with irony, for the murder had occurred within the very heart of justice itself. Nevertheless, his death didn't bring closure for these women. Five of them were arrested as the main attackers, and Borgad was one of them. But in the twist of things, every woman living in the locality claimed responsibility for the lynching. And when the cops refused to release the five alleged culprits, a crowd of 400 women and more than 100 men and children gathered at the courthouse to support the women. The crowd had residents from all kinds of towns and high-profile lawyers who refused to move until all five women were granted bail. The judge immediately moved the motion for their bail to be posted, but it wasn't until 10 years later, in 2014, that all charges against these women, including Borgad, were dismissed on account of inconclusive evidence. Now, Ana Jabai Borgad raises her granddaughter all alone, knowing she wouldn't face the same threats and abuse all the other women faced at the hands of Yadav. Marianne Bachmeyer. Everybody knows the story now of Marianne Bachmeyer. They've heard it a thousand times, but every time her story's told, it's focused on the astonishing act that she committed, rather than the person she was before, and the gripping life events that propelled her towards this destructive journey of seeking retribution. On May 5, 1980, Marianne's life changed forever after her daughter Anna was brutally taken from her in a horrific act of violence. A roller coaster of emotions would unfold as she sought justice 
justice. The shattered pieces of her life collided with the justice system. But before Marianne was a mother, she was a little girl who grew up in Sarstedt, Germany, under the roof of an abusive father and a carefree mother. Before she could even learn to walk, her parents got a divorce and her mother would remarry, propelling her into another series of struggle at the hands of her stepfather. He was strict and perceived Marianne to be a difficult teenager. It was a very conservative religious household with a lot of rules that she had difficulty following. Eventually, her mother kicked her out of her home and she would have to make it in the world on her own. So when Marianne was just a teen, she became pregnant with her first child and she decided to give up this baby for adoption. When she was 18 years old, she became pregnant with her second child, who she also decided to give up for adoption. The second pregnancy was supposed to be different. She had gotten pregnant with her boyfriend at the time, and she did want to keep the child. However, shortly before giving birth, she was assaulted by an unknown man, leading to this decision. In 1971, Marianne entered another relationship with a bar manager named Christian Berthold. The two of them hit it off right away, and for the first time in her life, she genuinely felt love. She would become pregnant once again, and Christian promised to support her and the baby no matter what. But nine months later, when she gave birth to a daughter named Anna, Christian suddenly decided to back out of his responsibilities. At that point, Marianne made a decision, a decision to pick herself up and devote her entirety to Anna's well-being. The only problem was Anna was a spitting version of her own mother. You see, Anna was perfect, everything that Marianne could ever want or need. She tried everything to raise this girl in a financial stable home. She tried her very best to manage working shifts at a local pub. It wasn't a great situation especially as Anna grew older and needed more funds for school. Marianne couldn't afford childcare, so she was taking Anna to the bar with her as she worked her shift. Then when they returned home, Marianne would sleep all day while Anna was expected to care for herself. It's obvious this is a horrible situation for a child to grow up in, and Anna would find herself in a very rough childhood. Nonetheless, Marianne never wanted to let her out of her sight until she was taken forcefully. May 5th, 1980, Marianne had an argument with Anna, and even at her early age, Age, she decided to skip school and go visit a friend. Now, it's unclear what exactly happened as she was on her way to her friend's home. However, what we do know is that Anna did come in contact with Klaus Grabowski. For the record, Grabowski was a local butcher by day and a serial just by night. This man was no stranger to hurting people around Anna's age. He had a criminal past and a pretty extensive history of abuse. He had two prior charges of sexually abusing girls and was also a registered offender. But here's the thing. In Germany, a convicted sex offender can opt into being castrated as part of their treatment. And I say treatment because the German government strictly refers to it as a treatment rather than a punishment. Now for Grabowski, he opted to undergo this therapy, but later avoided going through the process. But maybe if he did, Anna would still be alive today. Anyways, as Anna was on her way to her friend's house, it is believed that Grabowski lured her into his home somehow with the promise of letting her play with his cats, let's say. After a few hours in his house, he strangled her with pantyhose. Then he put her dead body in this cardboard box and discarded it on the bank of a canal. When Anna didn't report to school and Marianne was informed about it, she told the police almost immediately. It would have been fairly simple for the cops to put the pieces together as Grabowski was a sex offender and Marianne's next door neighbor. I mean, if they really wanted to do their job right, he could have been the very first person they would have wanted to speak to. However, it didn't get that far, did it? Grabowski's fiance called the police on his behalf because he had confessed his crime to her. Anna's body was quickly recovered from the canal bank and Grabowski was then swiftly arrested. But with his arrest came Marianne's quest for vengeance. At the police station, Grabowski admitted to killing Anna, but he denied molesting her. And this monster had a wild story to back that audacious claim, saying that Anna was the one who attempted to seduce him. And when he didn't go along with what she wanted, she blackmailed him by saying that if he didn't give her money, she would falsely tell her mother that he had abused her. So this guy apparently panicked and killed her. Just try to imagine Marianne's devastation, especially after hearing this ridiculous claim. To her, it seemed very unlikely and utterly impossible almost that her daughter would ever come up with such a ridiculous idea. So Grabowski was arrested and charged with a host of different offenses. The prosecution alleged that the crime was sexually motivated and they wanted to charge Klaus to the fullest extent with both sexual assault and murder. Grabowski denied these 
these allegations and the case went to trial. March 1981, the trial began, and during proceedings, he put up this ridiculous claim as to why he killed Anna. Mary Ann Bachmeyer had to sit quietly in the courtroom, day after day, listening to these excuses as to why her child was no longer alive. She lost her first child to youth, her second to abuse, and her third to Grabowski's depraved desires. Mary Ann couldn't sit quietly in this courtroom anymore. Grabowski needed to go. March 6th, 1981, Mary Ann snuck a 22 caliber Beretta into the courtroom. She would fire eight shots into the crowd, six of which hit Klaus in the back, killing him immediately. Mary Ann put her hands up and was arrested without hesitation and charged with murder. And to be fair, this was really one of the first big cases of vigilante justice that the German courts had ever seen. The media took this story and ran with it. Most people saw Mary Ann as a grieving mother who could no longer handle hearing about the horrible details surrounding her child's murder. Now this murder trial played out in court for about four months, with her defense team saying that she could not be held responsible for her actions because she was overpowered by severe emotional distress. Marianne took the stand in her own defense and testified that prior to that day, she had a dream where she had shot this man. And then she walked into the courtroom that morning, saying she saw visions of her daughter standing there, leaving her with no other option than to take action. With the overwhelming support of the country behind her, the charges were dropped. However, she was charged with manslaughter and unlawful possession of a firearm. Many letters and gifts were sent her way from people who supported her. Every news out outlet was covering her story, and Marianne was even able to sell that story for around 60000 though the money would go straight to legal fees. In the end, Marianne was given six years in prison, and really the most heartwarming moment of that trial was when she was asked for a handwritten sample by the doctor. And according to the doctor, Marianne wrote on this paper, I did it for you, Anna, along with seven hearts. Bonita Lynn Vela. Here's a question. Your life or your manhood? Pretty crazy. But these were the exact words Bonita Lynn Vela said to a man who coincidentally was her daughter's boyfriend and who she claimed had mal her son. The crazy part is she went on to slice his fun bits by using a box cutting knife. December 28, 2013 in Franklin, Indiana, Bonita Lynn Vela, a 35-year-old woman, was chilling around smoking weed and told her daughter to invite her boyfriend to their family trailer. Bonita harbored suspicions that this person had mal her son, and upon his arrival, Bonita, along with two accomplices, detained him in that trailer for three and a half hours, threatening him over this alleged offense. Now, initially, she was thinking about a severe punishment, probably murder, but she opted for a lesser form of retribution. She coerced the man into lowering his pants, indicating that she might spare his life if he allowed her to mutate his genitals. According to the man's account, Bonita sought to leave him with a permanent reminder of the harm done to her son. She initially used a fork to inflict harm, but then busted out the box cutter knife when the injuries proved insufficient. It was during this brutal act that she asked him the gruesome question, and the moment he was unable to provide an answer, the man was eventually released, pushed out into the cold night to seek medical attention at the nearest hospital, while bleeding profusely. Here's a twist to an already twisted story though, Bonita never provided any evidence that the man actually molested her son. She claimed to have conceived the idea immediately after smoking weed, and when probed by detectives, was unable to confirm or deny if she had consumed any other substances that day. On the other hand, the man denied ever committing such an act. It left the cops in this dilemma of deciding who was in the right and wrong. So while this man wasn't charged with any crime, Bonita was, with aggravated assault and given a 16-month sentence, 10 on home detention with a GPS monitor, and 6 on probation. Miriam Rodriguez. January 24th, 2014. Mrs. Miriam Rodriguez received a call demanding $2,000 to release her daughter from captivity. She paid that ransom and never saw her daughter again. Fueled with a perfect blend of anger, rage, and determination, she apprehended 10 cartel members seeking justice all on her own. It all started when men emerged from a building and climbed into a tinted glass Lobo truck. Some of them would have AK-47s, while others handguns. They headed for Tamaulipas, Mexico, where they met a young girl on their way. The girl turned around in fear, attempting to run the moment she set her eyes on him. However, before she could, two of these men apprehended her and threw her into that truck. The location of this incident is deserted, and the entire ordeal goes unnoticed. There is a brutal criminal organization that has these kind of daily operations. They're known as the Zetas. You see, since 2010, following the Zetas invasion of San Fernando, Tamaulipas, the city has undergone a dramatic transformation. Government built 
buildings face daily vandalism, and human remains line up the roadsides, reminiscent of haunting scarecrows. Safety is a distant memory now, especially with the surge of kidnappings prompting banks to offer loans for ransom payments. Over a fifth of the population has either fled or vanished in the wake of the Zeta's dominance. Parents now constantly have to shield their children from the horrors of these incidents, but this particular case was one for the record books, and I think by now we all know it's ending. March 23, 2014 in San Fernando, Tamaulipas. Miriam Rodriguez's phone rings. It's an unknown number. The call's brief, maybe two minutes, but the message is clear. We took your daughter and we want a $2,000 ransom. Before the call ends, someone on the other end calls out for Sama, followed by the disconnecting beep. Miriam enters a state of panic and immediately begins calling for help. She has to go out and find money to secure her daughter's rescue. So with the hope of recovering their 20-year-old daughter, Miriam and her husband had gathered the money, followed the instructions, and left it near the health center in San Fernando as instructed. The deal was to conclude with releasing the young woman in the local cemetery. However, days and weeks had passed, and they never saw their daughter again. But after the initial payment, Miriam received more phone calls. Give us more money, and we assure you we'll free your daughter. As time passed, Miriam began losing hope, and it's really hard to stay calm when you don't know what happened to your daughter. However, one day resignation had settled in her mind. A friend assured her that her daughter Karen would never return and that she was likely already dead. Later, the truth did come to light, confirming that her daughter had indeed been killed shortly after being kidnapped. Anger, sadness, resentment. Miriam vowed to seek justice with her own hands. She came up with a solid plan to locate these criminals and ensure their punishment. Her only lead, the person with the nickname Sama. Miriam would hawk her daughter's Facebook profile for a while as she navigated the desolate pages, and a photo tagged with the name Sama caught her eye. In mere seconds, she identified the man and traced him to an ice cream parlor in Ciudad Victoria, two hours away from San Fernando. The picture featured a young woman in her work outfit, providing Miriam with her first lead. Weeks turned into a routine of visits to the ice cream parlor. Miriam meticulously noted the young woman's schedule, open for the chance to encounter Sama. And by a stroke of luck, the couple appeared. Miriam discreetly followed him to a private residence her heart pounding with anticipation. The police could only intervene with concrete evidence, like Sama's real name and criminal activities, and she was out to get it all on her own. To do this, though, she had to disguise herself in order not to raise suspicion, and that's when her transformation began. She altered her appearance to blend in. She dyed her hair red, donned a Ministry of Health uniform, and carried an ID card that could pass scrutiny. She would go around conducting housing surveys to gather more information about Sama, and armed with a dose of photographs, data, addresses, and phone numbers, she sought help from various authorities, encountering rejection at every turn. And when she reached the point of giving up, one officer empathized and decided to assist. After considerable effort, an arrest warrant was issued, but Sama had already vanished. Undeterred, Miriam pressed on, using limited resources to continue that pursuit. And finally, she had her chance to meet the mystery man. As fate would have it on Mexico's Independence Day, Miriam's family clothing business in Ciudad Victoria received an unexpected visitor. Luis, her son, spotted a familiar face browsing their wares. It was Sama. Swiftly, they contacted police, leading to his apprehension. And the breakthrough in that investigation came during police questioning when Sama disclosed the names and locations of others involved in Karen's tragic fate. Miriam's tireless quest continued. She maintained her pursuit, capturing 10 of her daughter's killers, who had severed ties with the cartel and attempted to rebuild their lives. But she would persist, determined, to seek justice. In 2017, Miriam, now 55, embarked on another mission. Once again disguised, she tracked a former cartel member now selling flowers. She confronted this man, forcing his arrest. Her relentless pursuit led to capturing more than half of those involved in her daughter's murder, making her this real icon in San Fernando and beyond. However, the dangerous game she played caught up with her. Fearful of cartel retaliation, she received government-assigned bodyguards. But even with that, Miriam was fatally shot outside her home, dying on the spot. Nevertheless, her efforts made her a symbol for activism, but her family did pay a tragic price for it. Her pursuit of justice took place against the backdrop of increased disappearances in Mexico. But one thing we know is her legacy lives on, and her story will forever serve as a stark reminder of the challenges of confronting criminal cartels in Mexico.